You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Lisa Gardini was not born to fame and fortune. In fact, her family had fallen on hard times as wars laid waste to their lands. She was an unlikely subject for a prominent artist. Leonardo was a second-class member of his own family. He was acknowledged by his father, but barred from the family trade, and left to make his own way in the world. He was smart and talented, but bounced around, pursuing interests in science and engineering as well as the arts. He was notorious for trying the patience of his patrons, taking excruciatingly long to complete a job, if he finished it at all. He was an unlikely candidate to become a prominent artist. And Vincenzo Perugia was a humble tradesman. He had worked at the Louvre putting artworks behind glass in an effort to protect them. He actually built the box to protect the Mona Lisa. He was an unlikely culprit for the greatest art heist of all time. The crime was investigated by the best detectives of the day, but nobody could imagine the man with a postcard of the Mona Lisa on his mantle had the real thing tucked away in his humble apartment for two years. My guest this week is the author of a new nonfiction book, The Mona Lisa Vanishes, and we're talking about the highly improbable people and events that turned a lovely Renaissance portrait into the most famous painting in the world. I feel like who art ed? Who art is? Mr. Wood art ed me. Either way, it's it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. I thought it's a great start. Welcome to Who Arted Weekly Art History for All Ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today I am very excited. My guest, I'm doing this a little bit differently, I've got an author of a new middle grade narrative nonfiction book about the Mona Lisa's theft. Um, Join me today, I have Nicholas Day. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks, Kyle. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I, like I said, I'm really excited about this because I genuinely loved this book. I know it is said to be a middle grade nonfiction book, which, you know, for those who aren't in the, in that world of literary um, taxonomy or however we talk about it, middle grade would be what, 10 to 14 year olds or so. Yeah, somewhere between, you know, 8 to 12, 10 to 14, that sort of general area. Yeah, but I'm going to be honest, I am slightly older than that. And I, I loved this book because it is... It's a narrative nonfiction. There's a story to it and you, you lay it out so well. Like it was a, it was a quick and light read for me as an adult, but so refreshing compared to how dry the typical art history book is. That's great to hear, Kyle. That's, that's really lovely to hear. Thank you for saying that. Now, I do want to get into this, and I think one of the things that really struck me is as you were talking about this, you're getting at this the story, and really it's a collection of stories. And I'm most familiar with the story of Leonardo and the story of the theft, but I think you wove in here the story of the police work and the detectives, but the one I want to start with is the story we hear the least about, I feel like, the story of Mona Lisa herself. Do you want to get us started in just talking about, you know, her and her background and why she was so improbable as a subject for this portrait? Yeah, I mean, part of the reason that I think we know so little about her or, you know, she is not a character in her own story is that the sources are so thin, you know, historically. Um, Part of that is because, you know, women's history is just less recorded during the Renaissance, um, as it has been through most of history. Um, And part of it is that for a very long time, people weren't even sure that uh, Lisa Gherardini, as was her name, uh, was even the subject of the Mona Lisa. There was a lot of dispute about who exactly was depicted in the Mona Lisa and whether it was her. And it was really only, you know, in the past few decades that scholars have kind of become really sort of convinced 
um, that it that it actually was her. Um, and she was a, you know, not a noble woman, uh, you know, not mm. a woman of wealth, uh, not a woman of fame. Um, you know, what's remarkable about her is sort of how unremarkable she was. And that this unremarkable woman in many ways becomes the subject of the most iconic painting of all of all time. Like that's, you know, that's, that's a really great story. It, it really was. And I, I found it really fascinating. The detail that I was not aware of was about her dowry and how important a dowry was at that time. And her family did not have the money for, for one. And yet, she somehow was able to like her father talked to another guy or something like that. Right. And he accepted, what was it like a trade of some land or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Lisa Gardini's father was kind of a landowner. He owned land outside of Florence. He'd only recently moved to Florence. Um, and there had been a series of wars um, throughout that area of Italy you know, there were wars throughout the Renaissance um, and a lot of his land had been damaged. He ended up not having a lot of resources and basically put no money, you know, into the dowry. And at that point, there was this kind of weird dowry inflation that happened where like dowries just became more and more significant. And as Lisa Gardini gets older, there's, you know, nothing to support her in marriage. Um, and it's much more likely that she's going to, you know, become uh, a member of a convent, which is what happens to women who don't have dowries, who don't get married for whatever reason. Florence is not really a city where unmarried women exist. Um, women who, and women get very, very young. And so mm -hmm. like, you know, if you're in your 20s and you're not married, you're usually, uh, you usually go live in a convent. Um, and so it's really remarkable that she ends up being married at all. Um, and there's a, a silk and cloth merchant named Francesco del Giacondo, who agrees to marry her, um, for a dowry that's basically just land. So her father gives up some land outside Florence and he takes the deal. And that's very, very, you know, unconventional. It doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And I was struck just reading, there's sort of this parallel between um, Lisa Garandini's story of, you know, not having all of the means and her future being so uncertain. And I thought Leonardo's as well. Like I, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking they're just this scrappy bunch of lovable misfits because, you know, he was, he was growing up not able to inherit the land or not able to become, it was a notary, right? His father's business. He was basically like the second class child. He was acknowledged, but could not, inherit it seemed so sad to me thinking about like his experience growing up as seeing and being just out of reach of all of that stuff in high higher society right exactly yeah there's the story of the mona lisa is a deeply improbable story and that comes down through the subject through lisa gherardini who is this woman who was very nearly sent to live in a convent where her face would have been completely invisible. And instead, her face becomes the most famous face in the world today, you could say. I mm -hmm. don't think that's too much of an exaggeration. And it's an equally improbable story through the painter, through Leonardo, because Leonardo is born, as you say, kind of the second class child, because he's born out of marriage. And in Italian society, or at least that part of Italian society. That's not actually a taint that lasts your whole life. He is included in the family. He's not shunned, but he's always a little bit on the outside. When his father dies, he's cut out of the will. And so he has to make his own way in the world. Um, and his father is a notary, as you say, which today we think of as 
as a, you know, someone who just sort of like approves officially documents with a stamp. Um, back then it was a little bit more complicated, um, a position that's almost a little bit like a lawyer, um, which is notable only because it it seems so much the opposite of what Leonardo becomes. You know, a notary is a very formalistic, legalistic position. And Leonardo and Leonardo's life is anything but that. Um, and so, yeah, both of them are people who come at things from the outside and in some ways shouldn't be in the position that they're in. And so when they meet in this room, when Leonardo sits down to paint her portrait, it's it's a very unlikely story. And, and that's worth remembering because in some ways the Mona Lisa seems to us like it's such a well-known painting that I think it can seem obvious that it exists. Um, like, of course this painting is here. Of course this happened. But it's in fact the result of all these contingent, highly unlikely events. Um, and, you know, we have to be grateful for the fact that it's in the world at all. And it survived, you know, the theft. It survived hundreds of years of being moved around. Yeah. And I, I also, speaking of the theft, the irony of the fact that the Louvre was putting their paintings behind glass to protect them. And one of the glass makers was the guy who stole it. I mean, the effort to protect it resulted in the theft. If I had read it in a fiction book, I would call for a timeout and say this could not be, yeah. you know, but I, I do want to just close up with a little bit of just more background on Leonardo. Like what kind of guy was he? You know, you talked about how improbable his success was. As I've read about Leonardo in the background, I think I even did an episode that was like, did Leonardo da Vinci have ADHD? I mean, it seems so improbable that he would have risen to success. But can you talk about his way of working and maybe the greatness about it and maybe some of the pitfalls of it? Right. Yeah. Leonardo is an endlessly fascinating figure. And even today, you know, there are lots of books. I'm sure there are TED Talks that, you know, tell you how you can like be more like Leonardo, quote unquote. And I think part of the reason for that is he's just so inventive. Um, I think we have to be careful with that sort of language just because Leonardo is very much a product of his time. And he just, you know, someone like Leonardo, I can't imagine him existing today. But I think we can look at Leonardo in his time and see how even for Renaissance Italy, even for Renaissance Florence, he was a man kind of outside of time, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if part of that is because of his background, which is what we talked about. He always had to kind of find his way through the world. Um, on the other hand, there are lots of people who were, you know, were born out of marriage at that time, even lots of people who were remarkably talented, who didn't achieve things like Leonardo did. Um, and so he was, when you come down to it, tremendously creative. And we can see that, I think, most notably in his notebooks. We only have maybe 20 paintings from him. I think mm -hmm. the number is now 22 that are supposedly Leonardo. We have a few hundred drawings. But we have these uh, thousands of pages, I think, and there were many more that were lost, of his notebooks, which are just crowded with all of his thoughts and inventions. And back then, paper was very expensive. So every single piece of a notebook page is covered with what was going through Leonardo's head. And it's this rare record of a mind on fire. And he's remarkably imaginative, but more than that, He's remarkably willing and stubborn in following his own vision, um, his own ideas. He's not especially concerned even with artistic validation. If he was, he would have done something that was, you know, more significant than pointing the Mona Lisa. He had other offers, um, but he seems to follow where his mind leads him to a really amazing sort of way. Yeah, I think what what really struck me was that in 
our shorthand talking about Leonardo, we often talk about him as an artist, as an inventor. But I, as I'm reading this, and I've 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 read other stuff about him as well. Uh, what really struck me is, at his core, he was just curious, and he was you know he was experimenting in <laughs> weapons of war, in flight, in you know painting methods, and that's probably part of the reason that he doesn't have so much surviving work today. Because I think if I recall, the Last Supper started flaking off the wall just shortly after it was created because he was experimenting with, I think it was oil getting in there, right? He wanted to extend the drying time and and it didn't adhere to the plaster and stuff the way that traditional fresco methods were. Um, and I, I think he just, I was struck by just the way he, he just wanted to experiment and try everything that, that captured his imagination at any given time. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's what you see in the notebooks is you just see this remarkable, almost real time record of the thoughts passing through his head. And, you know, as you say, it encompasses engineering, it encompasses medicine, it encompasses these remarkably detailed thoughts about the natural world, how the natural world works. I mean, there are like, you know, I think there are 500 sketches of flying machines alone in Leonardo's notes. You know, some of the earliest versions of parachutes, helicopters, people have built a helicopter based on Leonardo's sketches. And I believe it it worked or it worked at least to some extent. Um, and that is really unusual that we can track someone's thinking. Um, hundreds and hundreds of years later. And we can really get a sense of where his mind was, what he was like as a personality. I think that's harder to say. But as you say, Kyle, like the curiosity is just overwhelming and intoxicating. Yeah. And I ultimately came to the conclusion that he's the kind of person that I love to read about, but I think I would find really frustrating to know in the real world because he was so curious and because he was bouncing from thing to thing. And I think that's part of the reason that to me, it became so astonishing that he reached the level of refinement in his craft, because you tend to think about to be so good at something you have to study and practice and practice. That's why for so many artists, we have hundreds, if not thousands of works to see their development and to see the mastery. And with him, it's it's just, you know, it's tens of finished works that we've got. But every one of them was so spectacular. It It just makes it all the more mind boggling to me. But now, after the break, we're going to get into one of those specific works. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Mona Lisa herself. Now, I always like to to talk a little bit about a specific work. You know, I think is it John Hodgman who repeatedly says specificity is the soul of narrative. So uh, for this middle segment, I want to talk about the Mona Lisa. What are you seeing as you look at the Mona Lisa? What jumps out at you? Well, these days it's hard even to get a good look at the Mona Lisa, of course, because the painting is so mobbed in the Louvre. And it's really ironic because it is a quiet painting. It's a painting that isn't really spectacular in the way that some Renaissance paintings are. It has to be closely observed, I think, for its uh, for its nuance, for the mm -hmm. subtlety with which Leonardo painted it, for that to really emerge. Um, and so in some ways, it's, it's this tremendously ironic situation. The Mona Lisa is a painting of, of many, many ironies, and that's one of them. But if we can look past the crowds, we can see how weird the painting is. Um, you know, Renaissance painting, especially Renaissance portraits, were very symbolic. Everything in a, a portrait is standing in for something else. And the Mona Lisa is very strange in that it doesn't really do that. Um, 
you know, there isn't jewelry. She isn't holding anything in her hands. She's posed before this, this weird, almost sort of sci-fi backdrop. Um, and that's a remarkable choice that Leonardo was making. We're not quite sure why he did that. He did have more liberty because, as we said before, Lisa Gardini wasn't a noble woman. And so he may have had less demands in terms of like what she represented. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if we look closely, even sort of beyond that, we can see down to the many, many fine brushstrokes that Leonardo used, the, the smoke-like way that he painted. Many, many, many thin, thin layers of paint. And you talked before about The Last Supper and the way Leonardo tried a new method of painting frescoes, which traditionally have to be painted very quickly on the wall. They dry very quickly. You can't take a long time painting a fresco. For The Last Supper, he comes up with a new method. The method almost immediately starts flaking off the wall because it doesn't adhere. And the reason he comes up with a new method is because he hates to paint quickly. Leonardo takes an extremely long time. He will take over two decades to paint the Mona Lisa, most likely. We don't know how long he worked on the painting. Um, certainly, you know, Lisa Gardini herself never saw the painting. Um, but the Mona Lisa is a product of that almost infinite patience that Leonardo had. Um, it's a painting of, of remarkable sort of nuance and grace such that, you know, looking closely at sort of every square inch of it is really remarkable. Yeah. And so, so what I'm getting from you is as you look at it, you're sort of seeing that story and all of that background noise and it's, it's historical significance. I think it reminds me of, um, and I can't credit who said it, but it, it wasn't me who had this insight that, Great paintings are almost not even about the paintings and what we see. That'll make a painting good. But what makes it great and iconic is a story. There's always a good story behind those famous works of art. With the Mona Lisa, what I was struck by, and I'm going to refer back to your book because this is a detail that I didn't realize until, what was it, the 19th century? People didn't even really talk so much about the, quote, enigmatic smile. That was something that we picked up on later on. In the first, let's say, 300 years of its existence, People just saw, said, like, no, oh, she's got a slight smile, right? It's a little bit of a smirk. It's like that girl in middle school who's looking right past you and, you know, like you just sense that somehow she's laughing at you. Maybe this is just me. Maybe I'm just turning this podcast into working out my childhood traumas. But um, there is something about that smirk that I think has captured people because – you make a connection to it. Maybe, maybe it's, you know, my, you know, self-consciousness, <laughs> you know, that like it reminds me of things from, from my past, but there's something about the way that he did it. Um, I've read that it's partially the sfumato technique, that smudging, that smokiness, that like the shadows just kind of dissolve around the edges. But I, I think there's something interesting about that. Yeah. At least that's what captures me. No, I think that's right. And I think the way you knew you talk about that smirk and her slightly sardonic smile, and that's actually a way that, you know, men, and it was entirely men, started to talk about the Mona Lisa in the 19th century in this sort of besotted way in which they, you know, they almost sounded like they'd been wronged by the painting itself. <laughs> as if she'd rejected them. And so it becomes a story of, of kind of, 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 of romance and especially sort of, a, uh, as if, as if she, you know, spurned their advances. It, it's a very funny turn in the history of the painting. And it's not at all the way people talked about it before. And, you know, the other thing we can say here is that there is this sort of subtlety and nuance in many other paintings, in all the paintings, right next to the Mona Lisa 
in the Louvre. I mean, this is a room of remarkable Renaissance paintings painted with very much sort of the same grace, the same extraordinary refinement as the Mona Lisa. And so in a way, the Mona Lisa is testament to the fact that we've decided to look at this particular painting very, very, very deeply. Um, and we've mythologized it and we've come up with all these stories about it. Um, for example, there's this phenomenon that the Mona Lisa follows you around the room. Uh, so if you're looking, you know, you're standing in front of the Mona Lisa and you're looking at the painting, she's looking at you. And if you're over at the side, she's still looking at you. And many people have found it a little bit spooky. Um, but it's also an effect that you can see in many other paintings, it's really because we bothered to look closely at the Mona Lisa that we see it. Oh, see, I think, I think actually you're right with that's an effect we can see in a lot of paintings. And, and that's because of the fact that on a painting, like the, the light and shadow and everything, it's fixed in position. And when we move somewhere else, like, you know, when I look at a real person in 3D and I move to another side of the room, the shadows and everything seem to shift, but I'm still seeing them frontally in a portrait that's fixed and everything like that. But I thought the Mona Lisa effect was most interesting because of the fact that her eyes are at a slight angle. And mm -hmm. for me, and and maybe this is just because I am a broken human being. She's not looking at me. She's looking over my shoulder. She's looking just past me. She's looking through me, you know, like I, I, I maybe it's again, that slight smirk and she's looking off somewhere else. Like there is a different sort of dynamic in how people interact with, with her and the way that she just seems too good for us. <laughs> you, know? Think, you know, they've actually done a study analyzing the so-called Mona Lisa effect, and they found that her gaze does seem to concentrate right over the shoulder of the onlooker. So I think, you know, what you sense, Kyle, is is exactly right. You're responding to how Leonardo made her eyes come out of the painting. Yeah, but... Like you said, there's something about the fact that it's it's so quiet in the end that I find really interesting. There's this calm, sort of cool sophistication to it that I think plays really well to to modern audiences. And I think obviously the theft was was huge in in catapulting it to the status of no longer just Mona Lisa, but the Mona Lisa. But I also think the fact that he's capturing a very different tone. He's not doing the monumental historical pieces. This is almost like an impressionist work where it's, you know, it's the genre painting. It's the scenes from everyday life. It's an ordinary woman that makes it a little bit more relatable at the same time. You know, it's this giant from art history who also did something that is down to earth. And people can make a more authentic connection to that than they can like Fragonard's swing and other stuff like that, where it's just like, this is so over the top and opulent. Like I can't see myself in there at all. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, there were many grander commissions that Leonardo turned down in order to paint the Mona Lisa. And there's, grander paintings that he started but never completed at around the same time. And pretty much all of those are more complicated, you know, often biblical portraits, subjects that were very different than this quiet painting of Lisa Gherardini. And I think you're right that that's a lot of why it resonates with us. It can communicate with us more sort of on an individual level. It's a more intimate interaction. Yeah. Um, agreed. And so now it's going to be a challenge for the final segment. I usually try to find a way to disagree with, with my guests. And I'm wrapping it up. I want Just a three-point rating scale. And where should this hang? The loo? Is this something to look at? The lab? The lab. Is this something to learn from? Or the loop. British for the bastard. Yeah, there's a the loop joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. What's funny about the Mona Lisa is that 
over history, people have treated it in all three ways, right? Over the 20th century, the Mona Lisa has been, I mean, people have thrown objects at the Mona Lisa. So it's been like, you know, people have literally tried to attack the Mona Lisa in a sense <laughs> to send it to the loo. Um, but they've also, you know, made their own versions of the Mona Lisa in which it's, you know, defaced, starting with Duchamp's famous version of the Mona Lisa with a mustache. And so they're sort of doing the last of our options here. And the Mona Lisa is maybe the most studied painting in history. And so they've run all sorts of different tests on it, put it under every imaginable camera. And so it's very much going to the lab, right? And then, you know, it is the most famous painting in the Louvre and the most famous painting in the world. And so I think it, you know, it checks off all three boxes. It's hard to argue with that. I mean, uh, and I think, wasn't it literally in the king's bathroom for some period? It was. At some, I mean, it was a very grand bathroom. It was a period yeah. in history where, you know, men kind of, you know, <laughs> like to hang out in their bathrooms, which were the, you know, size of apartments. Uh, but yeah, it was probably not the best storage conditions. Yeah, I, I would have to imagine, but it it has held up. Um, and I I got to say, I think you're right. And I think that's probably part of the reason that it appeals and captures our imaginations today is because it is a painting that ticks all the boxes that fits in every category that we can talk about endlessly. and always find more to discover and appreciate and enjoy. Um, and I got to say, once again, thank you, Nicholas Day. The book is The Mona Lisa Vanishes. It is technically a middle grade story, but I am going to just go out there and say it is good for every age. It is a great light read for adults, full of details that like I love the way you captured all these things about even the physicality of the theft of the Mona Lisa. Like the the idea that it weighed 200 pounds lifting that that uh, frame off the wall and the fact that only certain people would know how to do it. And we have talked for like half an hour about this and we haven't even scratched the surface. For those who don't know, Picasso went on trial for this. I mean, there are all sorts of things in here, um, all sorts of odd historical connections and fascinating stuff, uh, giving new insights all woven together in The Mona Lisa Vanishes. Thank you once again for taking the time to join me. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Kyle. And for any listeners interested in the book, be sure to check the links in the show notes, although you will be able to find The Mona Lisa Vanishes anywhere great books are sold starting September 5th. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.